morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all today? Welcome to uh, sunny, warm Florida. When I first moved down here, people used to say, you should have been here last week. The weather was great. <laughs> it's true. It really is. This is the coldest we've had all winter. I hope you like the venue in DeLand, uh, Daytona. We call this part of DeLand. Actually, we're the county seat. This is one of our suburbs over here on this side. We live on the cheap side of the county. <laughs> I think you've probably noticed that. Um, today's class is kind of a new thing in sport parachuting. I got interested in it a while back when somebody told me they had a canopy that did six to one glide slope. And I went, whoa, how'd you measure it? And they said, we used a GPS. I said, geez, I got an e trick Vista Garmin. I'm going to look at my data. And I went and looked at my data. And I had glide slope of 10 to 1. And I said, why? Something's wrong here. I'm a fully rated pilot. And I don't have sense to think back and say, what was wrong? Anybody here know what was wrong, what the difference is? You can't measure airspeed with a GPS. You're measuring ground speed. If you're going to measure glide slope, you got to measure airspeed and rate of descent. What we're dealing with is L over D. Well, I just did that part then. Uh, GPS shows ground speed. We need to know airspeed. Airspeed is actually best measured with the differential pressure system, like we use in airplanes. We have pitot tubes and, and static vents, and, and we measure the dynamic pressure coming in the front, and, and the pitot tube measures the static pressure, and that way we can compare it and compensate for altitude, because static pressure does change with altitude, as does dense, uh, uh, dynamic pressure. Dynamic pressure has a component of velocity. It's the same as static pressure, only it has a velocity component in it. It's only two kinds of pressures. Remember, air is a non-compressible liquid. And the best example of that we've been talking about the past couple of days is What's the pressure inside the cell of a ram air? That question has come up frequently. I'm yes. sorry, John, I've got to disagree with you on that. Air is not non-compressible. Air is compressible. Yeah. Air is a non-compressible liquid. If you compress air, it becomes a gas, and we call that scuba diving. Gas is all, air is already a gas. No, air is not a gas. Air is a liquid. Air and water are the same, and the difference is a density of 814 times. Air is a non-compressible liquid. Trust me. Talk to the physics man. Andre Lemieux here. He teaches physics. Talk to him. Um, I promise you, air is a non-compressible liquid. There's only two kinds of pressure, dynamic and static, and the difference is velocity. Okay? You're welcome to disagree, but and we, we can go look it up in Wikipedia uh, uh, 30 later. 30 years of engineering. Huh? 30, 30 years of engineering and four-year degree. And, and you don't agree that air is a liquid? No, air is a, air is a uh, fluid. Air is a fluid, in a cell. certainly. But a liquid. Is a fluid. Fluid, fluid right and liquid, here. same thing. It's compressed right here. No, no, no. Well, I understand there's some gravity pressure on us, and the density changes as we leave the planet. It gets thinner because the amount of air weighing down on us, that 14.6 pound per square inch, reduces as we go out away. And that's the density changes, but that's the magnetic forces of of black matter and things pushing on the earth. But air in physics is known as a non-compressible liquid. Show me an example where air is, is higher than static without velocity. That would be compression. Any engine. A what? Any engine. It's, a, it's then it's compressed into a gas. It becomes a gas when you compress it. That's why it gets hot. Excuse me. Okay. I think both you are right. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's true that uh, high speed, close to uh, transonic and supersonic, the, the, the air is, co is co uh, compressed, can be compressed. At low speed behaves like non-compressed. So it's compressed, but behaves at low speed like, like non-compressed. You're going up to Reynolds numbers areas, yeah. and that becomes a viscosity problem. And it's more viscosity than it has to do with compression. This viscosity of air is a result of higher speeds. In parachuting, we don't worry about the viscosity of air or Reynolds numbers because we don't go fast enough. Mm -hmm. We don't reach Reynolds numbers of 50,000. We don't even come close. Well, you both are right. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the question is actually kind of moot. It just depends on 
whether or not being compressible or non-compressible bears on this particular problem. Okay, well we're going to, we're talking about ram airs and how they glide and how they're inflated. The pressure inside the cell of a ram air is ambient. It's static pressure because there's no movement of the air inside the cell. What makes a cell bulge is the air pressure flowing around, the flow, airstream flow around the canopy, and as it flows, it aspirates a reduced pressure on the surface, and that's what makes the cell bulge, huh? That, that, that would be Bernoulli's equation. That's exactly right. Bernoulli and Newton are what make parachutes open and what make parachutes fly. Newton has some opposite and equal reaction uh, right. features in there, but basically it is Bernoulli, yes. Okay, for the purposes of this particular thing, I'll agree with you then. All right, well, all right. <laughs> All right, di differential pressure is not past practical for use at this time with parachutes. I'm working on a pressure sensor to, for my data acquisition system. For this project, to use an anemometer, because we're not dealing with speeds any faster than 25, 30 feet per second. Uh, how do you measure glide slope? Glide slope is forward speed versus rate of descent. We have an anemometer, and we need to measure rate of descent. The way to measure rate of descent is with a recording altimeter, which logs against a timeline. We have a data acquisition system, not here, can't show it to you, you'll have to come by our booth, we forgot to bring it in this morning. I saw it. Huh? I'll go get it. No, 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 sit down, we're not going to be there. I've heard lecture. Hey, come by the booth. Um, our, we have a really, really, really sophisticated data, data acquisition system that high school students use. It's from a company called Pasco. And they sell mostly to educational institutions. I discovered them about 10 years ago, and we're a dealer for them. And we put six systems together for the U.S. Air Force, and uh, they ordered four more. They liked them so well. We've used them for heavy drops. We use them for casual jumps. We've got several different data loggers. they got two different models. we got both of them. We've got A to D uh, converters uh, reading uh, force transducers built into three-ring systems so that we can measure direct poundage opening shock by riser. We also have accelerometers, three-axis accelerometers, which give us uh, a resultant G-force with GPS uh, built into it uh, so that we get tremendous data from that. The anemometer has a weather station built right in so you can get wind gusts, dew point, humidity, all that from it. But we had this system already, and I found they had an anemometer sensor, so I bought that. We mounted the anemometer out here. With the data logger, we have a vest for the data logger that has pockets for the different sensors and wires built in, the two-layered vest with wires built into it to plug into the three-ring if you have to do it, if you use that sensor. We can use any combination of sensors with it, but the anemometer sits out here in front, and on the bracket we mount a GoPro. And that GoPro gives us our brake settings against a timeline. Okay? So. Uh, we, uh, all right, we, we had to know how the data is processed. That's really the next most important thing. We've just now told you how we uh, uh, accumulate the data. But now we now have to know how it's processed. We researched for glide ratio data. We found a lot of fly, flag waving in the paragliding industry, and we did learn one thing. Manufacturers don't pu publish glide data. They load their wings at about 0.4 to 0.5. There are some paragliding associations which do publish some data. How is data published? Well, it's published in a, in a device called a polar curve. Anyone here's pilot has looked in the manual of their 172 or their 182 or whatever, and you'll see a polar curve in there. The polar curve is the curve that gives you the best angle of glide, the best speed of glide, so that you know where to go when your engine quits, so that you can get where you're going. So, I'm sorry? I didn't have that in my phantom. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a good thing to have. Anyway, uh, we found that the paragliding industry uh, is a little bit like the parachuting industry. They'd rather uh, sell you the sizzle than the steak. But I'm a data-driven guy, so I had to know. Uh, so I learned about polar curves. And the way I did it was I Googled polar curves aviation. And Wikipedia has got the best explanation. I just love that thing. You can't trust it because it's written by us. And you know what they say about things on the internet, they're all true. Yeah, right. Anyway, but it does tell them how to calculate it. And so we went and got some data. But we'll talk about it first. First thing, before you, 
before you can calculate the polar curve, you have to get the raw data, and that's what we use the data acquisition system for. So we make a jump, and I want to introduce at this time some software. Now, I think I hit escape, Johnny. Mm -hmm. Alt-tab. Yeah. Alt-tab. And here we go. Data Studio worked. Oh, boy. This is an output. Have I got a laser pointer here? See, I even have a microphone. I got a laser pointer. It's a good thing. All right. What we've got here, over here it says acceleration resulted in g-forces. That's the purple color along the bottom of the chart. This is altitude, all the way down like that, and landing. And you can see the g-force at landing. You can see the g-force at opening. On this particular jump, it was about three and a quarter g's at peak opening. Now, this is a, this is a static, a bitmap picture of the dynamic. No, oh, it's not. This is the actual software. I forgot. Okay, we've gone through the side, and I will do some manipulation of this in a minute to show you what wonderful software this is for analysis purposes. This we 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 went back and took the video, and we marked certain points. Deployment brake set, 10 feet per second rate of descent, 14 feet a second forward speed. That's this area here, and it's this speed here. Wind speed is this line here that goes up and down, like this, down, up, across. That's wind speed, and you can see it varies a couple miles an hour, and we try to take the, the mean of it, the norm here. So at deployment brake set, we know that we've got about 14 feet per second rate of descent. That's with the deployment brake. Release the deployment brakes, and you see we went downhill real quick. You can see the point we released the brakes, and you can see the speed we picked up as we jumped down and how that equalized down here. This line right here, I left on here, it's a dynamic slope indicator. It's currently located on a slope that's given us a 21 foot per second rate of descent. Now I'm going to sit down here and manipulate that slope a little bit if I can. Okay. Now look, I take it down to here to a clean area. That's 11, 11 feet per second. Don't be fooled by the M. But at, for, from here to here is 11 feet per second. Now I can set the sensitivity and the range that I want that slope tool to indicate for me. So I run the slope tool up and down the uh, altitude line and pick up these different rate of descents. And then I can put the slope tool on the, uh, as a matter of fact, if I were to go uh, to uh, wind speed up here and select wind speed, I could have a slope tool for the wind speed, but the wind speed is so erratic, you'll notice that here is that slope tool. And If I take it and drag it, it wants to go vertical, never horizontal. And I, that's because I don't have the code, I, I don't have the number of data points set to make it come across and give me an average. And I would have to do that. So I'm going to turn that off because it doesn't help us for this particular exercise. Okay. Uh, while I've got the chart in that configuration, I'm going to see if there's anything else I can show you. Someone asked about other, other entities. If I set, display the summary, it shows over here on the side the different um, data's uh, um, uh, points that I got. But if I go to setup, you can see that I've got temperature, relative humidity, barometric pressure, wind gust, dew point, wind chill, humidity, humidex rather, absolute humidity, unconnected connected bar. Um, thank you. Uh, altitude correction and site altitude. That's on that one sensor. On this sensor, I've got longitude, latitude, speed, course, altitude, oh, that's the GPS sensor, altitude, longitude minutes, altitude minutes with satellite count, and relative uh, longitude and latitude. One of the nice things about the GPS sensor is if it loses a satellite, it continues to record relatively from its last known position and then tries to correct when it reacquires the satellite. So this is a, a very sophisticated uh, uh, a data acquisition system. I've got 
my, alt, uh, my um, acceleration here for x, y, and z and resultant. And also, I've got my altitude. And once again, uh, I can change my unit of measure as I want. Uh, now, I'm not even displaying over here all of those other. I can display what I want here by selecting them in setup. Um, now, let me push it, make that summary go away. Back to a full scale map. And uh, show you some. Uh, I can take this and spread it out. Now you can see how the aer airplane. You can see the airplane. This is airplane climbing, altitude, exit, opening, and you can see how that can be. I have actually openings right here, and you're going to. And that little jump up is the is the transition from vertical to horizontal of the body. You can even you pick that out now. I can spread this out so that, see how I can stretch it? This is the way to look at data, folks. You can stretch it infinitely. And now you can see the wind speed here. You can see the G forces here in purple, and you can see the Burbles after exit, when you open the door, you get a pressure drop, you get out on the step, you get down and come. Finally, you open here, and you see the snatch point right here. Now, I can put also on here, uh, I have a tracking system. If I go to acceleration resultant, I can put a uh, crosshair on here so that I can locate the peak of that point. And that's 3.8 G's, and it happens at 88.3 seconds into the uh, uh, time, from the time I started the timer. I've been working with the people at Pasco. I got them to produce the GPS sensor for us, but they didn't do it quite the way I wanted them to. There's two levels of GPS, and they produced the cheapest one. And I wanted the expensive one, which has a clock synchronizer. I wanted the system clock in the data logger to synchronize with the GPS uh, clock, and that way external uh, telemetry could be synchronized with the internal telemetry, uh, so that, that would be especially useful with the Air Force work. Anyway, uh, that is the software to introduce you to it. So I'm going to go back to the presentation part. Huh. Okay. Okay, that was Data Studio. Now here, <coughs> here is a bitmap capture of a Data Studio page that we've done previously. Uh, on this one, this was a JVX 84 square foot canopy loaded to 2.18 pounds per square foot. Now Mikey Patterson's not here, but Mikey's our test jumper, tandem examiner, and and all-around rigger and, and, and good guy and floor sweeper and what have you. But Mikey likes to go fast under little parachutes. Anyway, he took the JVX. This is the first one we ever measured. And we picked up points here, here, here. 88 feet per second on a dive at this point. Notice how his speed went up to like 57 miles an hour, 57 feet per second. And uh, then again, the landing. And what's nice here is you, you see him hump for the landing, dive, Go pick up, come down, and swoop, and it actually shows him going below a uh, 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 ground level and coming back up to it. But that, of course, is a, a data error. <clears throat> and you can also see that at landing, how soft his touchdown was. Now, we said before that that's just data acquisition. The next step in this is to take these data points that we picked here, 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 and plot them on an Excel spreadsheet. Standard Excel spreadsheet. A polar curve is actually just a scatter graph of your rate of descent versus your forward speed. Then a trend line of a second order polynomial. Now don't let that fool you. The first trend line you're going to run into in Excel in polynomials is a second order polynomial. Just push the button, draw the curve. Don't worry about the math on it. Uh, but what it'll do is it'll produce a chart like the blue curve here. Now you see this is just a trend line. The actual data points are 
here, 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 and that's a trend line. Now, if you'll notice, this is nothing but the, the lower right-hand co corner of a Cartesian coordinate. Cartesian coordinates is x and y, positive y, positive x, and I'm doing that for your, I'm a mirror here. Negative y, the rate of descent is down, forward speed is that way. So, the ordinate is here, and it goes up to 50 feet per second. And here's the rate of descent in feet per second. It goes down to 40 in this map. Now, zero is here. This is the cross point for the full uh, system. This line right here is just a straight line that is drawn from zero to the tangential point of the, of the actual trend line. That gives you, that line, it becomes your rate of descent line. So the polar for the JVX84 at 2.18 pounds per square foot gives us an L over D of 1.17. I saw that and I said, well, it's about like a rock, but that's a misinterpretation. Let's face it, round parachutes, we didn't even get one to one. The worst I've seen is this little lawn dart. And that's what this is. It's a fun little parachute, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say anything bad about this parachute. It's a nice little canopy. But it's a lawn dart. It goes fast, and when it goes fast, it goes straight down. One of the purposes of this class is to eliminate some of the myths. People say, you don't have enough weight to drive it. That's just not true. The more weight you put on it, the more it goes straight down. You don't go more forward this way. Glide is based on, is uh, controlled by pound per square foot loading. Uh, any canopy which can be underloaded is unsafe at any weight. Okay, it's unstable. Oh, you don't, you can't load it. We've got every canopy we make. Nancy jumps solo. We make 400, 500 square foot canopies. She jumps them solo. She weighs 140 pounds, and they don't have. We don't have any problem with it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jeez, I can tell for that. Okay. Anyway, let's look at some more data that we've acquired here. This is a Katana 120, and we put 182 pounds on it. And also a nice canopy. It's got, look at this. Whoops, where's my button? 100 feet per second rate of descent, 50 feet per second forward speed right here. Look at that. That katana can dive. And you can see him come out, a little hump out here. Isn't that neat? So we did the same thing with this data of set as we did with the previous one. We put it into a polar curve. And we found that a katana at 1.51 pound per square foot loading. And notice I left out the size of the canopy. I don't know about PD's canopies. Uh, I, I, I know they have different sizes of different canopies, but I don't know how they go about creating those sizes. But on our canopies, the Firebolt, for example, if you load a Firebolt at one-to-one, -one, I don't care how big you are, how big the canopy is, if you load it at one-to-one -one and you take another Firebolt of a different size and load it at one-to-one, -one, they're going to perform really close to the same. We make 19 different size canopies, and they're all off the same patterns. We scale them. And we get away with it. We know how to do it. And performance is the same. So if we tell you that you can get two to one out of the canopy at that wing loading, you can get it now. Uh, we, we, you, you, it's going to be real hard to get a two to one glide ratio out of a 100 square foot canopy because you can't load it at 50 pounds. There's nobody that skinny. So it gets a little ridiculous as we go on. But anyway, this is good, 1.51. Uh, with a uh, L over D, I'm sorry, 1.1 pound per square foot, and with an L over D, 1.4. Okay, next next job. This is the first firebolt we tested. A firebolt 110 at 165 pounds per square foot. No, 1.65 pounds per square foot, I'm sorry. And uh, once again, got the same kind of data, had a 107 foot per second dive. Mikey likes to dive those things. Look, at, I love that. Looks like a ski slope. Anyway, um, here is the Firebolt 110 at 1.65 pound per square foot. We got an L over D of 2 to 1 out of that, and I was quite happy with that. I thought the Firebolt's a pretty flat trim canopy. It's not an aggressive, fast canopy, and we designed it to be a glider, and, and we've got pretty good glide out of it, at, uh, and I like this, 1.65 to 1. What I plan to do is take each test that I make on that canopy and take the size and the wing loading and the L over D and try to graph it so that I can prove out my theory of scaling. 
Uh, here's a Firebolt 119 at 1.52 pounds per square foot. Uh, he didn't get a big dive on this one, 48. No, he didn't do much dive. He did some diving here. He got, yeah, he got 86 feet per second here. Got some good speed up here too. Uh, let's see what the polar looks like. All right, this is a 119 at 1.51. I'll over day at one and a half to one. Normal, looks good. Okay, next one is a Firebolt 200 at 188.8 pounds, which is almost one to one. I think we might show that on the next graph. He got a pretty good dive here at 88 feet per second. I wish I could just get him to fly state the whole jump on one brake setting, but pilots have too much fun. Here's the polar for that one. At, at this is at 0.94, almost one to one. So it had an L over day of two to one. Uh, that's interesting because we just had one at 1.5 to one. It was at two to one, about two, yeah. 2.1 to 1 this is, or 2 to 1. I have to look at that some more. All right, next next one is a fire. This is the one, I took me nine months to get this jump made. This is our big tandem canopy, our 396. So I had Mikey Patterson, the same guy that's made all these jumps, go up and jump it solo, which we do all the time, because it's, it's also used as a tactical canopy. So as you can see, it's 396, so all up weight of 218 pounds. Look at this thing, right here, through this area right here, six feet per second rate of descent with a 23 foot per second rate of forward speed. Wow. So we took all this and put it in a polar curve like we did the rest, and look what we got. Five to one. And that wing loading is .55. I didn't put it on here because I wanted to cheat. Nobody wants to tell you that. That's what they won't do. To, uh, we, I, you know, I have, I agonize over that. Salespeople won't tell you. They'll just say it's five to one glide ratio, but they won't tell you that that's at 0.55 to one wing loading. Glide ratio is directly proportional to wing loading. If you add weight, you go down faster. It's just a parachute. Okay. Um, okay, what did we learn today? We learned that more weight does not mean more glide. We learned about the performance ability of certain models, the ones we've tested, or, or we've only been able to test six in the last year since I've had this data acquisition system. It, you know, private business, you don't have enough money to do the research and development you want to do. Well, sometimes it's hard <coughs> to get the data. Yeah. We've made jumps where <coughs> something didn't work and, and look at the... She makes, a, she, she makes a very valid point. The rest of the industry, we fight with it constantly in writing the standards for our certification and nobody in the industry wants to measure. And the reality is that you've got to measure. You've got to measure pilot shoot drag coefficients. You've got to measure opening shocks so that you have a metric by which to compare the strength of different components. And, but they've tried to write the TSO standards so that you don't have to measure. And they've really made a big mess out of the thing. Uh, the weight and speed does not give you a metric by which you can uh, uh, develop compatibility. So measurement is a bear. Half the time you don't get data. Even on simple little jumps like these that we're talking about, you start doing heavy drops, oh my God. Yeah, well, data, data, data rate of, of getting successful data rate is probably around 30% of the time. You lose 70% of the data for some dumb reason. Oh, I forgot to turn it on, I forgot to charge the battery. A wire gets cut to one of the sensors or something. So. Data acquisition is a real difficult thing. We've worked very hard over the last 10, 20 years to try to develop data acquisition systems up to and including 20 years ago, we were building our own 8-bit resolution data loggers. And now we buy this thing from Pasco and it's absolutely phenomenal. Write that down, Pasco. And the prices you see on the website are for institutions. If you call them, you'll pay 30% more. Because unless you're a university or an institution that's going to buy 10 or 15 or 20 of them or something. If you want one, you come talk to, talk to Nancy. She can get you one fairly cheap. Um, we learned how much up can be attained in a flare. We didn't look at that real closely in the, in the, in the uh, data stuff. But you can see that we, we see 8, 9, 10 feet per second up on a dynamic flare. We learned how much down could be achieved. How much you can dive those canopies. So we've learned a little bit about it. We've learned a, we have a new technology by which we can compare canopies. Uh, we can 
Uh, I'm sure that's never going to happen because, you know, automobile dealers don't want you to make direct comparison to their cars, and parachute dealers don't want you to make direct comparison, or manufacturers, I should say. I spent a long time with Chrysler Corporation. I'm a retiree from Chrysler, as a matter of fact. Chrysler did a lot of direct comparison. They would put out under-the-counter under the documents that showed comparison with Ford and Chevy back in the day. But uh, Ford and Chevy never did it. They sold the sizzle, and they stayed away from it. And Martin, different marketing people have different theories about that. But in parachuting, in most markets, they don't want direct comparison. Um, an example, uh, TS-135 requires that all testing, not all testing, but specific selected tests be videotaped, such as breakaway tests, et cetera. Has anybody in this room ever seen one of those tapes? One of those videos? You have, you just don't realize it. Anybody that's been to the Jump Shack website has seen it because we play it on our website. But that's the only place you're going to see it. Nobody else will play it. They won't even let you see it. I'm kind of calling them out and trying to get them to show it. If they show it, that means they have to compare. That means they have to look at somebody else's. Somebody's going to say, oh, look, that guy's faster than that guy. And, and they, they want to stay away from that. They don't want direct comparison. It's marketing. It's just normal marketing. And I, I, I can't blame them, but it, it galls me. It goes against my fundamental principles because I'm a data-driven guy and basically an engineering type, and I don't buy into marketing. All right, that's the end of the slideshow. Anybody have any questions?